Hello and welcome to Tech Deals. Real life gameplay, real life performance, and real life results between these two competing $2,000 computers. On this side of the table, we have AMD's Ryzen 7 3800X. And on this side of the table, we have Intel's i7 9700KF. Both eight core CPUs, although we have SMT, otherwise known as hyperthreading on the AMD, and none on the Intel. The price of both CPUs is very, very similar. They retail at 400 each. They can both be found a little bit less than that now, 360 to 370 or so for each of the CPUs. Now, the Intel doesn't come with a cooler, but we're using an aftermarket cooler on both, and I think a 400R CPU deserves one. I have previously covered both of these $2,000 builds linked in the video description below, very detailed part overviews. So I'm not gonna discuss their parts, their configurations, or any of that in today's video. I'll just put up a list of all the components here for those of you who don't wanna go watch the videos or maybe you saw them and forgot. I'll just put up the part components here. You can just see what is in them. But overall, these are $2,000 builds that are fairly even in terms of performance, at least on paper. The question is, when you put the built-in benchmarks aside and the short test runs that you often see and benchmark charts, how do they perform in the real world? In today's video, we're going to be testing the Division 2, and we're going to have it side-by-side -side, live gameplay on screen with MSI Afterburner real-time performance numbers up on the screen. Now, the Division 2 has a built-in benchmark, and some of you may say, well, just run the built-in benchmark and say what the numbers say. But we're not just testing graphics cards, and many built-in benchmarks are really graphics cards test and not full system tests. We are really testing the combination of CPU plus graphics card in real live gameplay because CPU usage and RAM usage and VRAM usage is sometimes different. And so this will give you a better representation of how well the game performs. And I even started at the same point in the game, at the same base, at the same spot on the map, to make this as close as possible. So with no further ado, let's take a look at that gameplay. Here you can see side-by-side -side footage of basically the same spot in the game. In fact, you can see the exact same blue car. I started at the same point on both machines to make this as even as possible. Now it diverges the further you get into the actual battle, and of course I end up doing slightly different things because live gameplay can never be exactly duplicated. Yes, I know the Division 2 has a built-in benchmark, but the idea here is to see real-time performance numbers when you're actually playing the game, as opposed to just running a short one-minute benchmark that doesn't really do anything. Now, the graphics card usage here is basically going to be maxed out the entire time. Because we are running both of these at 1440p high detail, unlike my recent Ryzen benchmarks where I did 1080p, we don't have the same issues with the RX 5700 XT. It has no problem running at full power the entire time. Hopefully, AMD gets that sorted out at 1080p soon. VRAM usage is very, very similar, about 200 megabytes more on the RX 5700 XT, but frankly, that's almost a rounding error, just a slight texture difference, nothing major. The CPU usage is where it gets interesting. Now, The Division 2 is not a game, at least in open world, player versus environment, single player mode, that you really need eight cores. So you're going to see that the usage doesn't hit 100% on either of these. If we were in the dark zone doing player versus player, which frankly, I just, I'm not a fan of, I'm no good at it. And if I tried to show it to you, it would be brutal. And so we're not going to do that. But you would see the CPU usage spike. I remember I did try the dark zone in the first division game and the load difference on the computer between the dark zone and just open world single player combat was noticeable. So it's something to think about. If you only care about the single player story, well, then frankly, you know, the extra, the extra threads of the Ryzen 7 3800X don't matter. Having said that, Again, this is a completely clean test machine with nothing running on it whatsoever other than the Uplay Launcher, the game, and MSI Afterburner, which of course is providing the real-time numbers. It's being recorded externally on another computer. There's nothing running in the task tray. OneDrive's not open. The antivirus monitoring's not open. Everything's been cleaned out to give this as clean a setup as possible. 
Most people's computers don't work like that. You're going to have stuff running in the background and Windows updates occasionally checking stuff or you've got another web browser running or you're listening to music or something else is going on. Now, if you look at the CPU usage, you will notice that the i7-9700KF is not in fact using twice the percentage of the Ryzen 7 3800X. There's a couple of reasons for that. First of all, the video cards are not the same, and I am fully aware that there's going to be complaints saying, dude, you didn't use the same video card. Well, yeah, you know, so they're pretty close. I understand that, but they are in fact pretty close. The clock speeds aren't the same either, but a Ryzen 7 3800X is not gonna run at five gigahertz, and if you're buying an i7-9700KF, what are you running besides five gigahertz? Okay, you might run 4.9 if you turn on MCE, which is what would be the all-core turbo under MCE. But let's be honest, who's buying a Intel K chip and not running at or around five gigahertz these days? So what I'm demonstrating to you is real world. These are the kind of configurations that people might actually buy and use. The Ryzen 7 3800X you can see is boosting to about 4.4 gigahertz. This is all it's got, folks. We have an aftermarket cooler on this thing. It will not go to 4.5. It really, really, it's a hard wall there. If you try to push it any more than this, power consumption goes up, temperatures goes up, voltage goes up, and then the machine just blue screens. AMD has pushed these Zen 2 CPUs as far as they can go. It, the same is basically true with the i7, except that Intel has left a little bit of overclocking room for people. This thing runs at five gigahertz without even trying very hard. Take a look at the temperatures, 67, 69, 71, 70, not too big of a deal. It's certainly hotter than the Ryzen 7, but of course we're comparing seven nanometers on the left to 14 nanometers on the right. The fact that an eight core 14 nanometer chip is only running at 60 to 70 degrees Celsius is certainly not bad. Now, as you watch this, you may look at the real-time performance numbers and you may say, well, those look awfully close to each other. Well, they are and they're not. The deceptive thing about watching live gameplay in real time, and especially if you like run your own computer and you just glance at the frame rate counter and say, oh, well, that's a, about what I'm getting. Unless you run an extended benchmark of playing this for 20 minutes or more, which I did here, then you really don't have a good sense of it. Just glancing at the counter, humans are terrible at doing that kind of real-time average. So take a look at the middle white number on the bottom row of the real-time numbers. That is the ongoing real-time average as the benchmark is running live. Now I'm gonna show you the chart here in just a minute. I can't show, well, I could show you the whole footage, but this video would be over 20 minutes long, so we're not gonna do that. The real-time numbers on the left the frame time, the amount of milliseconds between each frame is the second from the left. The real-time average is in the middle. The real-time 1% low is the second from the right. And the real-time 0.1% low is the furthest white number to the right. So you can kind of see a running trend as they go. We're currently trending nine frames per second faster on Intel than Ryzen. Now I've seen a lot of comments lately from people who say, well, AMD's basically caught up and they're just as fast, if not better than Intel in gaming. Well, I suppose if you were to handicap it, if you were to, for example, slow the i7 down to 4.4 gigahertz, yeah, they'd probably be a little bit closer to each other. But the reality is, is the Intel chip does run at five gigahertz and the Ryzen chip does not. So while in theory, theoretically, you could say, well, make the clock speeds the same because we want to know the pure per clock performance difference. Who cares? This is not theory, folks. This is real world. I care about how these are really going to run in your computer. Well, assuming you have a perfectly clean test configuration in the real world. And in the real world, this is how I think these are going to be run. Now, the interesting question is, does it really matter? Does 95 versus, in this case, 106 make two licks of difference between these two CPUs and in the real world? If we turned off the frame rate, could you tell the difference blind side by side? I would hold up my hand and say, no, you couldn't. I think that 96 to 106, which is what they're currently at now, is close enough I actually would call that a rounding error. It's scientifically, technically not a rounding error. It's a large enough difference. It is in fact a real difference. But from a human point of view, from actually using the computer, it's a rounding error. You are not objectively going to tell the difference between those two numbers without a frame rate chart telling you that that's what the numbers are at. 
If you objectively want more performance, frankly, you'd also need more graphics card. If you wanted to run at 1440p at 144 frames per second, a RTX 2080 Ti is going to be in your future. You could turn the details down and it would help to a certain extent, but you're going to want more graphics card if you want higher frame rates. Or you could certainly turn the resolution down to 1080p and that would certainly help get you on the Intel machine up to 144 frames per second. The Ryzen will get close, but even if you put a 2080 Ti, even if you lower the details, the Ryzen 7 3800X is going to struggle to do 144 frames per second in games such as this. Fortnite, Overwatch, others? Sure, absolutely, no problem. 144 all day long. But AAA games, it struggles with a bit, although it's getting better. And when you consider that the price of these two chips is the same, but the Ryzen CPU comes on a motherboard that has a future with upgrades, including up to a 16-core Ryzen 9 3950X, and it includes hyperthreading, or excuse me, SMT, because hyperthreading is an Intel trademark term, because it includes that for multitasking, multi-threaded workloads, for content creation, for anything besides just pure gaming, then that those extra threads are going to make the machine nicer overall, whereas the Intel machine is going to run out because it only has eight cores and eight threads and it lacks hyper-threading, at least until the next generation comes out. After 20 minutes of gameplay, the Ryzen 7 3800X system averaged 95 frames per second. The i7-9700KF averaged 111. But notice the 1% low and 0.1% low numbers were pretty much the same. These were very similar experiences. Yes, the average frame rate on the Intel was higher to be sure. You noticed at the beginning it started in the same spot. It diverged from that point. You certainly saw parts of it. I showed you a decent chunk of the gameplay. Both of these make excellent gaming computers. Me personally, I would take the Ryzen 7 3800X because I think the hyper-threading and the AM4 platform matters more in the long run. If I was going to do the i7, I would just spend the extra $150 and get the i9 to have the hyper-threading and just be done with it, to have the best that platform could ever have. And yes, I would sacrifice the video card down to an RTX 2060 in order to afford the i9 if necessary, because the video card you could upgrade in six months, nine months, 12 months, it's a simple swap. Take out the old card, sell it, put a new card in, upgrade it when you got some money, but you cannot spend $100 in nine months and go from an i7 to an i9. That is a major, major upgrade and frankly will probably never make economic sense. So if you're going the i7 route, do whatever you have to do to afford the i9. I think you will be grateful in the long run that you did. Well, there you have it. Two gold stars to anybody who watched all of that. I appreciate you sticking around. I talked for a little bit more than maybe I needed to, but hopefully you guys found that helpful, informative, and useful. This is the first in a series of a couple of these videos I'm going to make on live gameplay. I'll have a single overview video that has more than a dozen games tested, which is mostly just charts and some built-in benchmark runs. But I think these kind of deep dives into performance let you really see what's going on in an uncut fashion, because that was uncut runs on both of the CPUs, whereas if I just show you 30 seconds, what are you really seeing? If you've got this kind of money to spend, and even, you don't have to spend two grand, you can spend 1500 as I described in the parts overview guides. These are deluxe machines, shall we say. But if you're spending that kind of money, you want to know what you're getting. As I said during the voiceover portion of the benchmarks, to be completely blunt, between these two chips, I would take the Ryzen 7 3800X because it is hyper-threaded, SMT. It's got 16 threads, and because the AM4 socket will have at least one more generation of CPUs on it, the Zen 3 chips coming out at the end of 2020, and of course, even at the same generation, if in the future the Ryzen 9 3950X becomes cheap, you can always upgrade it to a 16-core 32-thread chip, unless something amazing comes out in the next couple of years. This doesn't have an upgrade path. Yes, you can put an i9-9900K on it, and to be completely blunt, you should. If you're spending this kind of money, then yes, this should have an i9 on it. To be totally truthful with you guys, the reason it has an i7-9700KF on it is because it was a sponsored build guide, and that's what Intel sent and said, put that in there. So we did. In the original parts overview and full disclosure, I disclosed that, and I also said at the time, put an i9 on there. It makes more sense. I would go down, as I said during the benchmark recording, I would go down to a RTX 2060 Super if that was what was required to afford the i9, because you can replace the graphics card easy enough, but you cannot just spend $100 and throw hyper-threading on the CPU. 
or wait about four months because new CPUs are coming from Intel in the second quarter of 2020, which might make more sense. Or just buy a Ryzen 7 and be done with it. Like this video if you like it, share it with your friends if you love it. Remember to subscribe to my channel with the big huge red button directly below. Questions, comments, thoughts, feedback, suggestions. I wanna know what you think of this format. Do you wanna see three more of these? six more of these or no more of these type of videos. I'll be interested to see what you guys say in the comment section below. Links in the video description below to both parts overview guides, as I mentioned before, and the various parts and components in these two systems. Thank you so much for watching. I will see all of you next time.